In this video, we're going to talk about how to account for investments. So the accounting for an investment depends on whether it's a debt investment, like for example, if your company were to purchase a government bond or a corporate bond or an equity investment. For example, if your company were to buy stock in another company and then they have ownership shares of that company. So whether it's a debt investment or equity investment is going to matter because it's going to affect the accounting. Uh, for example, one way that you can classify a debt investment is as held to maturity. So held to maturity, you have to have two things to classify it as this. You have to have the intent and you have to have the ability to hold the debt investment to maturity. So for example, if it was a 30 year government bond that you purchased, you have to be able to show that, okay, we intend to hold this bond for the next 30 years until it matures and we have the ability to do so. We're not gonna go bankrupt or something next year and, and not be able to hold this to maturity. So when you hold it to maturity, then we're gonna have it on the balance sheet at what's called amortized cost. And, and I have another video talking about that. Uh, so you can learn more about that there. So we can have it at amortized cost, which is not fair value. That's, that's the key point here. If you just want to get the key takeaway, it's not fair value for held to maturity securities. Okay, So any unrealized gains or losses on a held to maturity security is not going to go to the income statement. It's not going to affect that. Okay, And, and like I said, we talk about that later. Equity investments cannot be held at, or cannot be classified as held to maturity. It's not applicable. And the reason is, if you think about it, let's say you bought stock at another company, it's not like that stock matures at some point in time. So held to maturity really only makes sense when we're thinking about a debt investment. So it doesn't qualify for an equity investment. Now, you can also have a debt investment uh, characterized as something called available for sale. So available for sale basically means it's not a held to maturity security, right? So you've, you've bought this government bond and you're not gonna hold it to maturity or maybe you're not sure if you are or you're going to be able to, uh, but you don't intend to sell it either. You don't, you're not wheeling and dealing in debt investments. It's not like you bought it and said, okay, next month I'm selling it. You don't really know what you're gonna do uh, with, with this debt investment. And so you classify it as available for sale. So it's, it's not held to maturity, but by the same token, you're not sure if you're gonna sell it anytime soon. You don't know what you're gonna do with it. So you classify it as available for sale. Now available for sale is gonna be marked to market on the balance sheet. So it's gonna be classified at fair value. And then any unrealized gains or losses are gonna to go to an account called other comprehensive income, which is gonna bypass the income statement. So it's not gonna affect net income. Now, when I say unrealized, that, that means that the, the fair value of this government bond changed, but you hadn't sold the bond yet. Once you actually sell an available for sale debt investment, then you could have a realized gain or loss because now you've sold it and that would affect uh, net income. But unrealized gains and losses on available for sale debt investments bypass the income statement, go to this other comprehensive income account, which increases stockholders equity. Now, equity investments until 2018, before 2018, equity investments in the U, uh, for US GAAP, equity investments could be held at also at available for sale. However, from 2018 going forward, um, uh, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, they passed this new uh, rule, uh, basically ASU 2016-01, that said that, okay, you cannot have equity investments. They can't be at, available for sale any longer. Okay, So what are equity investments at generally? Well, if you own less than 20%, so when you purchase that stock in another company, if you buy stock in another company and you own less than 20%, which is usually the case, right? If you if you, you just buy a small position, 2%, 1%, less than 1%, is classified as trading, okay? And trading could be either equity investment or actually debt investments could also be trading, okay? So what trading is, is that it's gonna be marked to market at fair value, okay? And again, this applies for both debt investments and equity they could both be classified as trading so trading is saying that it's going to be classified at fair value it's going to be marked to market on the balance sheet but any unrealized gains or losses are going to flow through net income okay so that's different than available for sale available for sale they go to that oci account but with trading they flow through net income okay so 
Debt investments can be classified as held to maturity, right? They can be classified as held to maturity. They can be classified as trading, okay? And they can also be classified as available for sale. So there's really three different classifications. And so think about it like this. For debt investments, if you intend and have the ability to hold it to maturity, it's held to maturity. If you intend to sell it in the near future, let's say you intend to sell it in a, a month or two, it's trading. If you don't know what you're gonna do with it, with the debt investment, it's available for sale. With an equity investment, you don't have much choice if you own less than 20% of the company that you invested in, it has to be trading. There is an exception. There is an exception, it's called the practicability exception. It basically means that if for some reason you can't figure out the fair value or it's too difficult or whatever, there's some kind of issue, maybe it's not, you bought stock in some startup that is not publicly traded, right? So you don't know what the fair value is. You, you don't have any idea. And so what you would do is you would record this investment at cost minus any impairments. So if there's some kind of impairment, you would write the asset value down. Now, all that being said, so this trading is if you own less than 20% of the equity of the firm that you invested in. If you own between 20 to 50%, we say that you have significant influence and you're going to be governed by the equity method. Okay, so that you're gonna use this equity method where basically you, should, you get a proportionate share of the investee's net income, okay? I have another video that talks about that in more depth, okay? But, but basically you're not gonna recognize dividend revenue when you get a dividend uh, if you're using the equity method. Now there is an option to use this, this trading method, which for equity investments, I know this is confusing, but they actually call this uh, trading method, they would call this the fair value method. So this would be the fair value method for less than 20%. You can elect, to, if you have a, between 20 and 50% ownership, you could say, you know what, I don't want to use the equity method. I have to, I want to use the fair value method. Okay. And, but it's a vocable or uh, irrevocable election. So once you made it, that's it. Now, if you own more than 50% of the company that you purchased the position in, you have to do what's called consolidation, right? So basically their assets and their liabilities become the parents' assets and the parents' liabilities. It's not as easy as just adding the two balance sheets together because that could result in double counting. And, and we'll talk a lot about uh, consolidation and, and how it's done in, in future videos. Uh, but just suffice it to say that it's, it's a lot different than the equity method in trading. And you cannot, you cannot, if you have to consolidate the firm of the, or the, the investee, you can't elect to do this fair value method. So it's not like the equity method where you could say, you know what, I don't want to do the equity method. I want to do the fair value method. You can't do that. Now, there are exceptions. There's caveats to everything in accounting. And so in some cases, when you don't own more than 50%, you might still be required to do a consolidation. There are these things called variable interest entities, which you might also heard of as special purpose entities, SPEs, and, and so forth. Uh, so in some cases, you might actually be required to consolidate a VIE, even though you might not own more than 50% of that. And we'll talk about that in the videos to come.